Thank you very much, Barbara, for summarizing the history of today's meeting. Maybe I can spend a couple more words regarding the project we have worked at together. In 2011, Barbara was writing a proposal at the Scuola Santana, a proposal to take part in a call for tender of the European Union. We were missing a German partner, and I remember that she decided to sit down and write down the part regarding the ethical evaluation of the Robolo project. The project was successful, it was funded, and for 36 months we have worked together with our UK colleagues and our colleagues from the Netherlands to make the ethical and legal analysis of robotics in Europe. And our final document was the guidelines for the European Union in order to rule robotics in Europe. Good morning. It's beautiful to be here with you today. I'm not an expert in robotics, but I know a few things. So I shall try to give you some examples. Examples provided by the research work carried by the institutes I used to work for at the Department for Human and Social Sciences, Sciences and Cultural Heritage of the Consiglio Nazionale di Ricerca specifically the Institute of Research and Technology of Cognition in Rome and the Institute for IT Research in Pisa, as well as several other institutes that have given a significant contribution to robotics in Italy. So let me start with a small digression. The CNR, the Italian Research Center, introduced cybernetics in Italy. The CNR started research on automated calculation. We have electronic engineers who have become famous, such as Mauro Picone, for instance. When the time came to further develop cybernetics, that's how it used to be called at that time, there were several connections between the CNOTE, the University Center of Electronic Calculation in Pisa, and all these different institutes. And I still recall the tape reels or the mechanographic cards we had in our institutes. They were carried by car to the CNOTE, and then we received back piles of paper. It was the 60s, but the interaction between universities, CNR, and companies played a very important role. Therefore, even though I'm not an expert in robotics, I know about all these things, and I shall quote interesting examples. Also referring to the research work we're carrying out right now. Priscilla asked me to talk about responsible research and innovation. I don't know how many languages you speak. I speak many languages. But I would like to add the twelfth language in my case, Eurospeak. Eurospeak is the language you speak in Brussels. It is a language full of pauses. There's so much you're not allowed to say. And there are many things that we still need to learn. So the acronym RRI is a very important acronym that goes hands in hands with a longer acronym S W A F S SWAPS. That means science with and for society. So we have RRI, Responsible Research and Innovation, and Science for Society. This is a further development. At the beginning, the program was called Science in society, SIS, then it became SAS, science and society. And then it became science with and for society. So the two acronyms are important because they mean a lot of money. We're talking of 940 million euros as a multi annual financial period in the Horizon 2020 project. 
It is almost 1 billion euro that will be dedicated to cross-cutting research in the field of responsible research and innovation. So it is useful to know how and when. The European Commission has invested money, a serious amount of money, for a series of initiatives. So why and what did they want to reach? The concept, it is necessary to increase the level of participation of the audience, of the public, so the responsibility of science and research towards the public and vice versa, it is necessary to increase the people's responsibility towards science. So you can see this in two ways. The public meets the scientists and scientists meet the public. Right now, we're actually focusing on this concept that can be expressed, unfortunately, only in Eurospeak, back to this new language I was talking about. The integration of society in science and innovation, that's the idea. In other words, science and innovation do not stand alone. Society participates, society is integrated in science and innovation, in research and innovation. Sometimes we talk about science and innovation, other times about science and innovation, other times again, research, innovation and development. There are some differences, especially for those who work in the field of economics. Anyway, when the idea of cross-cutting grants was developed, and we're talking about about 40 million euro each year, so each grant has a value of approximately 40 million. So there are different approaches which are not mutually exclusive. So we have the ethics of responsible research and innovation, governance, this is very, very important. It is important because the governance of ethics and research and innovation is multi-level, multi-layer. I like to give the example of the city of Warsaw, a very interesting city. I recommend you to visit it. Well, the multi-level issue is very clear in Warsaw. This city is a jewel with beautiful museums. They have reorganized museums. The Chopin Museum is so interesting and so innovative. Then you have the Museum of the History of the Polish Jews, another interactive, interesting museum. And they also have the Science Center Copernico on the river Vistula. This is an example of multi-level governance. Why? Because it is a space where society meets science and where scientists meet society. But especially society meets scientists. It is not a science museum. It is a museum where children, adolescents, elderly people can come in contact with science in a hands-on way. They stand in front of machines and make them work. Machines are renewed frequently because, of course, you can't have a 30-year-old machine for a hands-on experiment. And there is room for exchange, which is funded 50% by the city of Warsaw. Just like the city of Rome under Mayor Marino, it was ready to develop the project of the city of science. They did not do that in the end. But the multi-level project starts locally because the participation of society in science is territorial. We do not want to talk about world science, global science. We want to talk about the inhabitants of Warsaw and Liverpool, for instance, who have things to say, issues such as transport, vaccines, public health, living conditions, radiation. But of course, it is not just the city of Warsaw. 
it is also the region, the Mazovia. There is the country, Poland, with the competent ministries. And in the case of responsible science and innovation, we have the Ministry of Research working in close contact with the Ministry of Culture, because it is the minister, Ministry of Culture that is competent for the space of exchange. And then, of course, there is the pan-European legislation providing directives, which are clear and which are interesting. So it is in our interest to implement them. I do not have much to say about gender. Of course, it is very important. We have this idea of the gendered innovation. So science and economics. I mean, if you, if you think that they are tailor-made on the male gender, well, this is a masculine delusion. Many people think it, it is true, but it is not true. So we still have a lot of work to do. So we have a space for exchange. Open access is a, an obvious term today. It was less obvious in the past when the program Science in Society was developed. Now it is clear a lot of information is open access. Research funded by the state is open access. Let me quote an example. We're working at the new edition, the second edition of the complete work by Manuel Kant. It will be ready for the tricentennial of his birth in 2024. It is a huge work, of course, and it is being developed in a very sophisticated way, and all this will be open access, because that's how it was conceived. So we will have results that will be immediately accessible. Education. Well, as I told you before, science Literacy Education, that's the acronym. So we need to make the young people literate. The young people are the important audience for us. Uh, specifically, we're talking of an age range between 25 and 35 uh, male citizens. The male citizens in this age relinquish participation. Female individuals, 25 to 35 years old, participate, but not the male ones. And we want to reach these people, people who make decisions, who need to be reached and persuaded to open up to exchange. Let me give you another important word in Eurospeak, co-creation. Co-creation is a concept that can be found in the literature since 2000, even if I read in 2004 there. It was quoted in the Harvard Business Review. It is the idea that innovation used to be closed. You probably remember when you were a child, Microsoft used to sell packages, and they were closed. You had to pay for this because of copyrights, very expensive copyrights that allowed these companies to make their profits. Now we are trying to see things the other way around, because closed innovation is no longer profitable. After some time, the product is no longer useful, just like the Microsoft products. Open innovation is by far more interesting. Open innovation opens up to consumers. Consumers become proposing users. They can propose because they're informed. So a joint creation of value by the company and the customer, allowing the customer to co-construct a service experience. This is economics, starting from pioneering studies carried out towards the end of the previous century, like the work by Herrick von Hippel, Democratizing Science, published in 1995. Then we have Chesbrook's book, Open Innovation, a much quoted book. 
Today, if you read it, you'll find it obvious, but it started everything and led to the idea of co-creation. Then we have the very fragile concept of experimental knowledge. Experimental knowledge is fragile because it is not institutional. It is not the knowledge of a professor who, from his or her chair, claims we've done this, we've done that. This is the case of scientific knowledge. Experimental knowledge is a fragile knowledge which, however, is rational and robust. It is the knowledge of lay people. And this brings me to this last sentence, technological innovation. Telephones, the internet, fridges, then we have social innovation. Social innovation occurs when technological innovations meet three requirements. These are, does it fix the problem? Does it cost right? Is it universally accepted? Let me give you an example. The healthcare card of the region of Lombardy. It was ready in 1998. For the first time in Italy, it was introduced. This is technological innovation with electronic files containing all the medical records, the chip in the card, the card was distributed to the citizens. Does it solve the problem? The answer is yes. In the past, to get the results of your exams, you had to go and get them. With that card, everything is inside the card. Is the cost right? Of course it is, because printing the chips in the cards is less expensive than making photocopies, delivering them, and asking people to waste their time. Third question, is it accepted by everybody? Yes, it is. Nobody said, I feel it is wrong that the region of Lombardy has got my medical data on the chip in the card. So this is social innovation. An example of social innovation that has not been achieved yet is personalized medicine. The FDA has approved of a Novartis drug that takes care of certain forms of leukemia that used to kill a high number of children. The drug works, but there is no social innovation. Why? Because the drug works, but it works in a very limited number of cases, and it just extends life ex acceptances, but it is not a cure, even though about one week ago a final version was released that is actually curing. Second, the drug is terribly expensive, $457,000 for one child. Third, society cannot accept this. It is too expensive. It is discriminating. So right now there is no social innovation regarding this drug. Maybe it will come in the future. And let me now come to the very last syntagm. A little bit difficult to digest, so to say. Cultural innovation. When I talk about cultural innovation in China, my audience reacts as follows. They say, well, we like culture as it is. Culture is something old. Leave it as it is. I mean, how can you talk about cultural innovation? We do not want any cultural innovation. Let us be. Well, cultural innovation is a reality. What is it? It is reflecting on things. It is the contact between the user of a technology, which is there, which is accepted, with its other, the relationship with the other. So the first field of cultural innovation is cultural diversity. So integration in society, which is the objective of responsible research and innovation, brings us to this very delicate issue of cultural diversity. 
Co-creation allows us to measure cultural innovation. In other words, technological innovation is the feasibility of a product, that is, research, money to knowledge, innovation, knowledge to money. The product is ready, it has to be launched, it works, fine. Social innovation is the acceptance of the product, and cultural innovation is reflecting on the product. How do you calculate that? In terms of co-creation. What does co-creation mean? mean? It means I write about it. If I write about it, that's important. But today, you can report also by simply downloading a film via Netflix. Netflix works in a perfect way as far as co-creation is concerned. Netflix knows who you are. Netflix knows you, your age, your gender, your profession, your income. You are a consistent field of participation with Netflix, which is open innovation. Downloading a film, you express what you're interested in, what you're looking for. Co-creation in the 21st century is the measure of cultural innovation. That's it. Let me now go quickly through all this. Integration of society in science and innovation. Who are the lead users? Well, these are civil society actors, i.e. firms like Netflix, non-profit organizations like the Casa di Risparmio of La Spezia financing the Festival of the Mind, NGOs, trade unions, local authorities, political decision makers and users. So we're talking about co-designing, co-evaluating and co-funding. Co-designing, let's develop this new thing together. Co-evaluating, let's get together and see how it works. And co-funding. The important point here is that if we keep things as they are, nothing will change. Italy is famous for this. Nothing changes much because our ruling system is incredibly stiff. We do not manage to impose new interesting prospects because the law just blocks us in this respect. As a matter of fact, open innovation requires a consistent effort of reform of the ruling environment. You may say, well, this leads to relativism. It does, but this is a relativism that we build together. We talk about value-sensitive integration of technological and social innovation. It is a delicate field, but that's why we need a space to exchange ideas. And these spaces become the places where you can develop a value-sensitive integration. We have terrible things, things today, especially in Italy. The irrational component, that fragile knowledge which is not rational, but it is robust. Fine, but fragile knowledge, when fragile, becomes irrational. And we see this in Italy with children's vaccinations, with Dibella's cure. There are some horrendous things that remain in the collective imaginary because the collective imaginary needs magic, needs enchantment. The post-truth is exactly the reason why we must think about a continuous series of reforms of the ruling framework. False truths survive because of the indifference about fact-checking. 
Fighting post truths means accepting the truth. The co creation of knowledge needs to be arranged in such a way that the collective knowledge is a result of a free and rational exchange amongst all the participants. So, participation is the main issue here. This is a topic that I had debated with Fiorella Battaglia, worldwide expert in epistemic injustice. Knowledge is not distributed in an ethical way. There are some people who have more knowledge, others have little knowledge. It's an issue of access. It's the issue of the digital divide. I've mentioned gender innovation, home economics, the masculine delusion. You can find more detailed information on the website. Then there is the, the re innovation forum. There is a very interesting prospect for your research. Do you know what ERIC means? ERIC is an acronym. You will speak again. But ERIC is particularly important because it is worth a lot of money. ERIC stands for European Research Infrastructure Consortium. This is the highest level of aggregation of resources to optimize research in specific areas. There is a uh, research infrastructure on aging, one on demographics, one on linguistics called Clarin, one on the cultural heritage, Eris, and Daria is dedicated to humanities and arts. This is an example, cultural big data, Internet of Things, co-creation once again. So have a look at this on the website. Let me now conclude referring to the book by Mark Kirkelberg. Barbara Harry has told me that Mark Kirkelberg was your guest at the Santana School a couple of months ago. Well, this is a very important book, New Romantic Cyborgs, Romanticism, Information Technology and the End of the Machine. I believe you know this book. Kirkelberg says romanticism is the part of fragile knowledge that we do not want to see, being fascinated by unreachable things, gothic motifs, transcendence, enchantment. So what are these new romantic cybers? Kirkelberg claims that either the irrational tendency pertains to human beings or it is a property of object. Well, let's imagine that the question has not been posed directly, like Heidegger said in 27. It is pointless to talk about categories, dimensions. Let's suppose that the question should be rephrased in order to explore a new prospect. So let's transcend the human-non-human -human distinction. Let's leap into the unknown and let's rely, and this is the positive side of fragile knowledge, let's rely on the therapeutic effects of technology. So, this is the last part of my presentation, but I believe it is very relevant to the topic you are debating here, the integration between man and machine, the machines we would like to have. And I shall conclude with an example. Imagine a drone swarm. A drone swarm consists of 100 drones. 100 drones launched on a farm, nine hectares, a real estate. The drones flying on the farm can collect in one day a huge quantity of data. These data can be used by the farmer 
in an extraordinary way to increase the yield or to decrease undesired effects. This is possible. But in order to do that, the farmer must tell the people planning and programming the drones what he or she needs. So having the drone flying over your farm once every two years, providing you with data that can be used to improve the yield of the farm, is something beautiful. However, it must become obvious that the expert programming the drones and the farmers communicate with each other. So responsible research actually boils down to something very, very simple, i.e. having users talking to those who program machines so that machines can give exactly what is necessary for the well-being and the happiness of the users. Thank you very much.